I think, yeah, giving this talk right now, um, if I had a colour printer, I would have printed out the picture of the red mainland of Australia because um, since the absolute decimation of the Liberal vote and the Aston by-election where um, Labor won an absolutely blue ribbon uh, Liberal heartland seat and then also the New South Wales election result, a lot of people are going around with this yeah, picture, this map of Australia um, entirely red except Tasmania, which is blue, to signify wall-to-wall -wall, um, across the government, uh, across the country, Labor governments, and obviously um, federally the the Albanese government. But I think what we need to understand is, you know, we're at this particular moment where Albo is riding incredibly high. Um, he managed to break the Greens' arm um, and get through the CPRS legislation. There's him, you know, the boy from the Housing Commission, the child of a single mum, you know, standing up there with. Um, you know, with the head of the US and the head of the UK announcing this, you know, massive um, arms race, this huge uh, militarism with the AUKUS deal. You know, Albo is riding incredibly high, and people look at that, you know, it, you know, wall to wall redness across Australia and think that we're in this incredible period of Labor honeymoon. But I think we need to start by saying, yes, there's Labor across the board, but that red is a very thin crust, and under it, um, you know, is both a wellspring of um, deprivation and anger from working class people who voted Labor. And I also think if you scratch the surface, under the red policy, you look at the policy agenda that Albo stands for, it's blue. Actually, the, the key things that Albanese is doing are all rehashed um, Liberal Party policies. So I just want to start with that. Um, that, um, yeah, trying to understand like the depth of the, the kind of honeymoon period that Albanese is in after a year in power. I had a look at Kevin Rudd when he came to power um, after, after um, the, the end of the Howard government and his um, honeymoon was sort of averaging around 65 to 70 per cent um, a pop popularity for 2.3 years. So he was riding high for you know a whole other year um, you know down the track from where Albo is now. But I think it's got a very very different quality. What what happened when Rudd came to power? He re he represented now Rudd. You know he was a hard out neoliberal. He kind of had a populist gloss to what he stood for. It's not like his you know policies represented a real break with Howard in a in a fundamental sense. Nevertheless, he. he he put together packages that did represent a break with the Howard era. He, he got rid of work choices straight away. He signed the Kyoto Protocol and talked about you know, action on climate change, things Howard hadn't been prepared to do. He apologised to the stolen generation. Within that first year, he was spending billions and billions of dollars um, protecting the Australian economy for all of its um, you know, problems from the, the global financial crisis. So that was the nature of um, of Rudd's, Rudd's honeymoon. What do we get under Albanese? I think what we need to understand is that the popularity of Albo right now is much, much more to do with the absolute decimation of the Liberal project than it is to do with any actual positive enthusiasm for what Labor stands for, which is very, very little. Um, you know, the Liberals are in absolute de disarray and we need to, you know, think hard about what is the historic significance of what's going on. But I think the fact that the only, you know, viable leader for the Liberal Party is this ex-Queensland cop, T um, Dutton, who, you know, is just carrying the legacy of the Howard attack dog of Tony Abbott. You know, they just represent transphobia, racism, you know, an absolute rump of right-wing cultural politics. And I think what you can see is actually the corporate class in Australia is looking at that project and saying, you know, there's serious questions about whether we back that or not. So they are on the ropes, you know, 100 per cent, and that makes Albo um, seem really high. The other thing which I think is really important is the absolute, um, you know, failure of the union movement to actually mount a, um, a campaign, even in the election running up to the election of Albanese. You know, the impact of COVID on the unions, the absence of that, so that when Rudd came to power and we beat Howard and Howard lost his own seat, 23 seat swing towards uh, Labor when Rudd was elected, it came out of the Your Rights at Work campaign where hundreds of thousands of workers struck and marched against work choices and there were actually demands on Rudd and, and uh, you know, a movement from below to actually inform um, you know, the, the political quality. Whereas the truth is there's no 
there has been until this, this moment, and there has now been a national um, strike rally in the last week, uh, the first one under Albanese, but until then there is really no um, demands on the Labor government from the unions. And I think those two reasons are why, um, you know, why Albo seems to be riding so high, but I think we can expect to smash it and we have to smash it. Um, so, you know, we talked um, previously about the, the importance of the, um, the small target, and I think we can see the, the Labor small target project, um, you know, manifesting in, um, in just really um, entrenched Liberal Party policies. So, um, Paul Keating has been one of the, the big, you know, guys who's actually said the emperor has no clothes about AUKUS, you know, came out and said basically, you know, compared to Penny Wong and Albo, who are from the left of the Labor Party, I sound like a Bolshevik. This is what Paul Keating was saying, and I'll come back to Paul Keating, um, because, you know, they're there um, presiding over nuclear, um, a nuclear project which sees a massive expansion of militarism, which sees US bases in Port Kembla, et cetera, et cetera. So it was up to um, a force like Paul Keating to actually, you know, expose how right wing uh, the, you know, the policy is on, on AUKUS. But look at the other things, the safeguard mechanism, that's an Abbott policy. The stage three tax cuts, that's a SCOMO policy. I want to talk briefly about higher education because I think, you know, we don't talk a lot about it, but it's, it's extremely telling. Um, you know, right now, uh, the the new Labor government's education, higher education policy is to have a year-long talk fest called the Higher Education Accord, where the policies that are actually in place right now were the ones designed by um, Tudge in the last term of government, where they are the, the job-ready graduates uh, bill that sees arts students going from $20,000 of higher education debt to $43,000 of higher education debt and another 15% of public funding taken out of higher education. So for the year when we're watching this talk fest in higher education, those policies are still going on, those students are still in debt. If you know, There's no labour policy for higher education until the next election under this. And I think that is very, very telling about across the board the way that ALBO has inherited and continues, um, you know, what are Liberal Party, what are Liberal Party policies? So, um, and I think what we need to also understand is that at this time when Labor is scooting along with the policies that they've inherited, we have a really profound crisis going on in the working class, which is called the cost of living crisis. But I think that kind of understates what's actually going on, which is a fundamental shift of wealth from the working class into the corporate, um, corporate coffers and into the Australian ruling class, a massive transfer of wealth. So on average, at least $5,000 in real terms have come out of workers' wages. Um, and wh where are they ending up? They're ending up in an incredible um, increase in corporate profits. So 69% of the inflation that we're paying is, is actually price gouging. That's literally um, corporations putting up their prices and, um, and, and just recouping those costs. And what does it mean? It means that Profits have gone up by 43% in the last three years. Billionaire wealth has, has gone up by 61% in the last two years. So our wages are going backwards in an incredible rate. And for people on job seeker, people on low incomes, it's it's absolute crisis point. You know, reading about people who can't send their kids to school towards the end of the pay period because they don't have food to put in their lunch boxes. Um, you know, people going hungry because they're feeding their kids and they don't want their kids to find out. This, you know, that there is a huge, huge transfer, transfer of wealth going to the rich um, and workers' wages are going backwards. So this is what um, Albo is, you know, is presiding over. And what do we need? We need job seeker raised immediately. We need public housing. Um, you know, we need money for um, public sector wage increases, which will help wages go across the board. But what are they doing? Absolutely none of that. Instead, they've got the, you know, obscene amount of money for the nuclear submarines. They're still backing in the stage three tax cuts, which are going to see $15 billion a year that could have been spent on, you know, climate jobs, on renewables, things that we need is um, going into the pockets of people who earn 
$200,000 or more, um, you know, $11 billion a year going to fossil fuels, $50 billion a year going to, um, you know, negative gearing and capital gains, which is where rich people wrought taxes. So I think um, we have to, you know, be, be really clear about the fact that when it comes to the absolute crisis inside the working class, Labor is doing nothing. All they are literally doing is to say that they back the, um, the minimum wage case, uh, you know, that, that workers shouldn't go backwards on the minimum wages. That is not even a government decision. That's something the Fair Work Commission does, and their verbal support is nothing in the face of the crisis that working families uh, are facing. Their childcare policy they keep talking about, that's coming in in the middle of the year. Again, it's a subsidy that goes to people who earn up to half a million dollars um, they get fee relief from childcare. This is not even a drop in the ocean, it's obscene. So Labor is presiding over a, a real, um, you know, a real gutting of working class people's wages which are going into the, the pockets of the rich and, and they're doing absolutely nothing about it. So how do we fight Labor? I think one of the things that we really have to do and the, one of the tools that I think Solidarity offers to the movement is actually an analysis of what of what is the nature of the Labor Party, because therefore, how do you fight it? And I think um, I'm going to talk about the experience in the First World War, which, um, you know, when Paul Keating came out against AUKUS, he said this decision is the worst since um, Billy Hughes tried to introduce conscription in the First World War. Um, I talk about Keating a lot in this talk, but he threads a nice um, kind of thread through this. So I'm going to talk about that because um, I think it shows some really, it's a really important illustration of the fact that Labor um, is a fundamentally contested um, project with conflict at its heart, and that's of key strategic importance for socialists. So just to spell out what is the nature of the Labor Party, the Labor Party was formed out of the defeat of the um, strikes in the 1890s. Union leaders, not ordinary workers, but union leaders said, we need a political project, we're sick of being attacked by the state, you know, the bosses' fines, the bosses' jails, the bosses, um, you know, tying our hands behind our back. We want a seat at the table, and they formed the Labor Party. Um, but when Labor governments come to power, they have always and continue to run the system on the basis of the needs of Australian of, of the Australian capital uh, of Australian capitalism. But this creates fundamental fights because Labor in power is forced to always attack the people who voted for it, its working class base. And those fights are absolutely key um, for, for socialists in a way that I'll try and explain today. So just to go to the First World War, what happened? People sort of remember the First World War as this you know, piece of you know, carnage, sending millions and millions of people to, to die in Europe. But at the very beginning of the war, there was mass enthusiasm for it in Australia and in a lot of other places. Um, and Labor was, um, Labor in opposition, ran on the basis of gung-ho support for the British Empire. And they said, we'll fight to the last man and the last shilling. We will do everything to sacrifice to, you know, to beat the Germans. In, they won the election in 1914 with 50% of the popular vote in the House of Reps. That remains the highest um, vote that they've actually ever, ever received. So they came to power on the basis of support for the war and there was incredible jingoism from across the community supporting it. But the war starts to bite and within the first year you get 12% um, of inflation, something we're not unfamiliar with. And you start to get, you know, actually more people were leaving and being killed in Europe during, during the First World War than were actually um, coming home. So, you know, devastation for, um, you know, of, of people going to fight. Um, and so slowly, slowly, um, anger and resentment at the war starts to build up. And, you know, for working class people, just as today, feeling the effects of that inflation, not being able to buy enough, feeling the constraints of the war, they start to put pressure on the Labor leadership to, uh, to, to oppose it and to do something about the standard, standard of living crisis then. So in May 1915, um, at the New South Wales Labor Conference, there was a motion put to um, push what was, what was Labor Party policy, which was a referendum to control prices. Now, we needed that kind of referendum today to control prices, to actually deal with the, um, <coughs> the cost of living crisis at that, 
at that time. So that's what you know, came out of Labor Party policy, and they were saying they wanted the Federal Labor Party to implement what was Labor policy. Billy Hughes, who was then um, the, the Labor Prime Minister, threatened to quit um, as a way to try and stop this. And they eventually, the Labor um, project, uh, Labor Party pulled back and said, okay, we'll, you know, don't quit, we'll drop this thing about the, the, um, the referendum to control prices. But the anger within Labor was, was, you know, was ratcheting up. Um, later in that year, the, um, the Labor government put out this war census, which was, um, you know, they asked questions about, you know, if you're of enlistment age, why haven't you signed up for the war? And this was seen as, uh, rightly, seen as a prelude to introduction, introducing military conscription for the First World War. So a movement begins to actually oppose that. And it comes from, um, among other places, we can talk about um, the international workers of the world and various other forces that were organising this, but certainly within the, the Labor Party um, in Labor conferences, etc. So in early 1916, both the New South Wales and Victoria Labor conferences vote to disendorse any MP who supports conscription. So this is again like movement from the base of Labor and anger from working class voters forcing the union bureaucracy and their, their Labor Party members to actually put some controls over what the federal Labor government does. Um, you get four, sta four states where the ALP came out um, against conscription and motions in all the, um, in all the Labor Council um, conferences. Then you get an Australian-wide trade union conference against conscription. Um, you get, uh, there's a, in the last magazine, not the current one, but there's a really good article about the, um, the big fight in Broken Hill where, uh, you know, people were, were striking and organising against conscription. They even did something like um, put together an anti-conscription conscript force where they were signing up military age men to fight against conscription and they got 2,000 uh, people signing up for that. So in August of, of 1916, um, a demonstration organised in Sydney's domain with 100,000 people um, marching against conscription was organised by the New South Wales um, Trades Hall and New South Wales Unions. Um, Hughes tries to ignore this and tries to create a plebiscite for conscription and hopes that the, the movement in, you know, and a war enthusiasm in the public will, will start to put down his own um, opposition inside Labor. Um, that, that plebiscite happened in October 1916 and gloriously um, the plebiscite was lost. And at that point, um, the, well actually sorry, before that, um, the, so the, the Labor branches then move a resolution to, um, to expel any MP who supports conscription and kick out, um, kick out Hughes. So he then forms a, um, an alliance and a, a new party called the National Party and continues to try and uh, create the case for conscription, loses um, two referendums on that basis. But what are the lessons from this, this episode? I think the first one, which is very familiar today, is that Labor in Power um, puts the interests of Australian business over the interests of Labor voters. So when it comes to imperial uh, wars, um, the, the need to bring powerful allies from, you know, in that case it was England, now it's the US attempting to pull powerful allies into our region by sacrificing Australian workers in overseas wars. Um, you know, that we saw that in the, in the Iraq war and we see that dynamic again today. Um, and, um, sorry, yeah. Then, then I think the dynamic within Labor, why, would, why was there such a tremendous fight against conscription inside Labor? You see that dynamic of ordinary workers in their unions organising to defend their standard of living and organising against war. That pressure f fills into the Labor Party where people um, then actually fight to hold to account people in the, in the higher levels of the Labor Party. So workers are disciplining union officials and union officials are disciplining or attempting to discipline um, those at the head of the, a of the ALP. And I think that dynamic of tension and crisis within Labor is absolutely key for us because 
for the one thing, it's a strategic thing that we want to, you know, create hell for, you know, our fight against the top of the Labor Party and their doing the bidding of capitalism. On the other hand, we want to, the people inside Labor and who look to Labor and who are in the unions are the key audience for socialists in actually building a transformation away from capitalism. So to relate to those people, to support their struggle inside Labor is part of actually us winning um, an audience amongst those people. That's 20, okay. Um, I'll just sum up by saying, um, you know, in the decades that have passed, and I think Paul Keating, you know, he talks this great talk against, um, you know, the Tories in every way, and it's great to see him, you know, exposing Wong and Albo as being as completely right wing as they are. But he is personally responsible for the neoliberalisation of the Labor project, which has actually gutted a lot of this. You know, when you see Labor branches passing resolutions, tens of thousands of people organising under the Labor banner. We've got a long way to go to remobilise those, those sectors of the, of the population, and a lot of that is because of what um, Hawke and Keating did in power um, in the late 1980s in actually shrinking the lifeblood of the ALP and reducing um, union membership and in industrial combativity. And some of the, the story of that is what's going on in the other session about enterprise bargaining right now. Nevertheless, though, those tensions in Labor still remain. So look at the AUKUS question. Um, the Maritime Union has come out against AUKUS, the, M the ETU, Vic Trades Hall, the ACTU, the South Coast Labor Council, you know, they are organising a against Fort Kembla. They are having their May Day, um, you know, combining the, the question of union power with the opposition to what this Labor government is doing um, with, the, with the AUKUS deal. The Petersham branch of the ALP, it's, um, you know, have passed motion. So I think what's critical for us is that, you know, a lot of the left have a sectarian attitude where they look at anything to do with Labor and say, these people are part of the problem because look at what Albo's doing. But for us, actually, we say these people are crucially part of the solution. The ALP is a divided and contested um, space and we want to win the, the base of it to being part of the, the, the solution and the fight against things like AUKUS. I mentioned earlier about the, the demonstration last week with um, CFMEU officials having the first national strike that we've seen since COVID and under the Albanese government. And I think that is incredibly important. You know, there's a lot of um, rhetoric from the officials which doesn't unfortunately match, match you know, necessarily what they're, they're organising strategically, but it is incredibly important that they're beginning to say, OK, we've got these Labor governments, we got them into power, we're the ones handing out for them, now where are the wage rises? Where are the union rights? Where are the things that our members need? And I think we should see it in the same way. The, the suffering and the, the you know, sense of going backwards of ordinary members and you know, construction workers pushes um, those, those leaders to actually stand up and demand something from Labor. And it's a, it's a very, very crucial, um, cr crucial thing. So for, when Christy Kane from the um, CFMMEU comes out and says, you know, we want a general strike for 8 per cent because, you know, 8 per cent wage rises because that matches inflation, um, you know, ALP, you owe us, we're coming for you. That is an important dynamic and we want to be cultivating that and we want to be organising it and we want to be making it as real as possible. So I think our job as socialists is to see those cracks in Labor's popularity, to understand the potential for cracks inside the Labor um, project itself to break into a more serious opposition to Albanese that actually his popularity doesn't represent any deep sentiment. There is huge space to shake this government and to fight for a substantial, uh, meaningful struggle that can transform our lives.